Today we're wondering, who gets to claim citizenship within the wide world of sports? Certainly baseball, boxing, soccer, track and field stuff, and basketball. But is physical activity what defines a sport? Down goes Frazier! Down goes Frazier! Down goes Frazier! The heavyweight champion is taking the mandatory eight count and Foreman is as poised as can be! If so, then this thing where people try to iron pants on a surfboard is a sport. What about hillbilly mud wrestling? Slap fighting? Does rolling down a hill in a giant inflatable ball sound sporty? When I was a kid, I noticed the rise of a new religious denomination in America, centered around the defense of the sanctity of the word sport. Around the time ESPN was new and struggling to find cheap ways to fill 24 hours of airtime each day, these faithful fought against the notion that golf or car racing were sports. Their understanding was that athletics is not a category of sport, but that sports and athletics are synonymous. On today's show, we'll investigate whether or not they're right. There's a golf course in the middle of Springfield? What's golf? I know you too. You're that guy that said golf is not a sport. Well, it's not. Oh, really? Yeah, no cheerleaders, no blood, and the only cups involved are in the ground. How the crush we get through that thing? I've seen my dad do this. I teach, I teach this class on sports history and I always count games as sports, you know, um, and half the students don't like it, and half of them do, you know, it's, this, it's never something that goes away. In the 19th century, they would have, if you told them that um, uh, something like any professional sport today counted as a sport, they would tell you you were crazy, because sport was supposed to build muscular Christianity, it was supposed to, to build your morals, it was supposed to build your mind, and the reason chess counted in the 19th century is because it was one of those games that was building your mind, it was wholesome, it was something that actually made you better. That's what sports were supposed to do early on before they became professionalized. Which um, what else do we got, Nick? Here's a question right here from a beautiful fellow right here who is, um, has a question. And I just want to know, is bowling a sport? We are throwing that hit a 15 pounds, heaviest object in any sport, down the lane, hours on end. It's a, I think bowling is definitely a sport, man. <laughs> you know, this reminds me of a debate I had with my, my brother Niles about whether or not Stephen Sondheim is really light opera. See? Easter eggs, clown pants, and baby cars. I love you clowns. I think there's two very interesting things about the word sport in English. The first is that it was originally a two-syllable word. When it first came in, it was disport. And the other thing that's really interesting about, about it is that it's closely related. In fact, it's based on the same Latin roots as the word deport. So if you carry someone or take someone away, you deport them. And it's really the same basic roots in both words. In fact, if you speak Spanish, you may know that uh, the Spanish word for sport is deporte. Uh, ESPN has a Spanish version of its network. It's ESPN deportes. So there you can really see the connection between deport and sport. I wish they would is do- darts a sport? Darts? Hey, that little boy is playing three games at once. Check me. Check me. Check me. Dang. Yeah, for sure, the definition of sport has, has changed over time. So um, when people in the 19th century spoke about sport, they mainly kind of referenced blood sports, um, particularly within a British context. So it, it's really only into the 20th century um, when we increasingly mean sport to... Uh, to refer to human sport, human athletic competitions. And then again, into the 21st century, obviously, we've gone into e-gaming and those kinds of new developments. So, yeah, definitions of sport have, have certainly changed over time. The rules have changed over time. And the, the kind of industrial context of sport has changed over time. One reason of asking the question of whether chess in particular is a sport is that if it isn't, American sports history is importantly reduced. Paul Morphy won the first tournament in America designed to crown a national champion. He then set sail for England, 
to begin beating Europe's finest players. Morphy, having beaten the best players on two continents, is the first player who can reasonably be considered the world chess champion, and was one of America's first sports celebrities, not to mention one of America's first successes in gaining any European respect in an intellectual field. Morphy helped begin the change in how Americans viewed sports stars before baseball continued the work. Yet, the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame refuses to induct the state's first and arguably biggest sports star because he wasn't hopping up and down or throwing anything when he defeated the European champion Adolf Anderson. If you'd like, you're welcome to sign a petition I started to have Morphe inducted in the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame. The link is in the description, or you can bug them directly with a polite email. When I was getting interviews for the Morphe series, which you can watch on this channel, please subscribe by the way, I traveled with my Uncle Russ to Valdosta University to talk with Professor Thomas Aiello about Paul Morphy. On a side note, I still have at least two episodes left to edit on the Chess Legacy Morphy series, but I promise I'll get it done. Uh, well, he was, you know, the, the first American champion. He was the first, uh, at least free, sports celebrity uh, in the South. Uh, the only other real celebrities uh, the only other real uh, uh, sports celebrities in the South were horses or jockeys who were almost uniformly slaves uh, at the time. At this time, games and sports were associated entirely with the lower classes. The only two sports that um, were common at this point were boxing and horse racing, um, both of which were seen as lower class endeavors. I mean, we are still pre uh, Major League Baseball at this time. I mean, so professionalization doesn't even happen there. And even when it happens there, it gets a bad reputation. But it's re that's the first time that professionalization looks middle class in any kind of way. And that's not till the mid-1870s. At this point, it is only slaves who are jockeys and poor people and immigrants who are boxers. Those are the only people making money off games. We're still at the infancy of that kind of celebrity. Morphe is so often seen in chess circles that he is often given short shrift in this kind of celebrity sports culture and he is really kind of one of the earliest celebrities in that realm that doesn't get talked about very much. I have talked before to the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame about putting him, he's not in the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame, which is crazy because he is the most important sports person of the 19th century uh, and is not there because they just don't see it in the same category as, as other kind of uh, games and celebrities. Like any regular fella, I like to collect old dictionaries. One use of this hobby is that you can look up the same word to see how it changed in definition over the decades. Caudry's 1604 dictionary is supposed to be the first English dictionary but the word sport doesn't appear in my copy. I found a copy of Kersey's 1708 dictionary online, but didn't find an entry for sport. I did find the word in Nathan Bailey's dictionary from the mid-1700s. It's defined there as a pastime, diversion, or play. By the late 1700s, Samuel Johnson's dictionary included entries for sport, sportful, sportive, and sportsman. Sport still centered around play and tumultuous merriment. Fishing and hunting are mentioned. I guess American football would kind of fit this definition, but only if you describe the game as merry frolicking. Contemptuous mirth is mentioned, so maybe that hints at competition. Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary includes longer entries for sport. It's still centered around diversion, play, and merriment, but includes mockery and idle jingles. Still nothing on a requirement for athleticism. I didn't actually find athletics included until 1919, which sports fans will recognize as the year the White Sox threw the World Series. Amusement, diversion, and fun are still listed first, then ridicule and hunting and fishing, but then running and jumping and competition between athletes is added to the list. Athletics is included in this 1919 Oxford entry, but not as a required element, and none of the older definitions were then excluded. A sportsman or sportswoman was defined as a person fond of sport and unafraid of taking the risk of failing. By the time my 1947 thesaurus was published, chess was still enjoying its centuries-long inclusion within the definition of sport. That inclusion endured into the 21st century. My 2001 Webster's hadn't changed things much. 
For sportsmen or sportswomen, the only requirements are that you engage in sports, play fairly, and win or lose with grace. I think that's my newest dictionary. I stopped buying new ones after the word literally became a verbalized exclamation point. I also found that chess was reported on within the sports pages of newspapers from Washington, D.C. in the 1930s to England about a year ago. Sports Illustrated seems to think chess is a sport. World champion Bobby Fischer made the cover. So did U.S. women's champion Lisa Lane. They've also interviewed world champion Garry Kasparov and covered last year's cheating accusations. ESPN reports on chess, too. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, even the Olympics recognizes chess as a sport. Having lost my 20-year battle to make people use the word literally correctly, I know as well as anyone how the English language changes over time. It soaks up words from other languages, even as existing English words change. For example, so much of the English language comes from French that there's an old joke about the English language being a dialect of French. For more on this, I reached out to Kevin Stroud. When I was working on my English degree, episodes of his History of the English Language podcast helped me get A's on a few papers. This has been something that's been debated a lot over history. You have uh, what are sometimes called prescriptivist and descriptivist, but it's really just two different ways of looking at language. One way, you know, the, the prescriptivist version is that there is a right and wrong, and we have to you know, abide by certain rules in terms of grammar, and certain words have to be pronounced certain ways. And then there's the, the more modern descriptivist approach, which is more about just describing the language the way it actually works, not as concerned uh, with right and wrong and arbitrary rules about the language, but just acknowledging that English varies uh, tremendously, like all languages do, and it changes over time. So there's, you know, there's really it's very difficult to say, you know, what's right and wrong, especially given that a lot of the rules that we have are somewhat arbitrary, particularly when it comes to grammar. The, a lot of the, the rules we have, like you can't end a sentence with a preposition, or you can't split an infinitive, or you can't use double negatives. You know, those were arbitrary rules that were imposed in the 1600s and 1700s, and really in the 1800s. If we were to go back in time, we would find that Shakespeare and Geoffrey Chaucer did all of those things. So, again, the modern approach is just looking at accepting the fact that language varies and changes over time and uh, just tries to identify how it works rather than saying that there's a right and wrong way to use the language. You can make it competitive. Yeah, you got to be Competitive doesn't make it a well. sport. Competitive doesn't make it a sport. It doesn't make it a sport? No. Well, that's a good question. What makes something a sport? Yeah. Are video games a sport then? Those are competitive. Uh, Is no. dancing a sport? And I did cheerleading. That's a sport. I think a sport to me feels like something where you compete against someone else at the same exact moment. So tell us why you both wanted to come and do this. So she's the one that I was the one that uh, carried her with me. Um, I wanted to win the bloody cheese, really. <laughs> I really wanted to win it. Free for the cheese! For the world! <laughs> I wanted to ask a sports historian and writer about this question, and Jean Williams was kind enough to meet me online for a chat. She's a sports professor and a leading scholar in women's football. Um, so is sports synonymous with athletics, or is athletics kind of a category of sport, would you say? Yeah, athletics is a, a subcategory of sport. So um, um, the definitions of sport can refer to any field of human endeavour which um, combines, um, obviously, motor skill, um, strategy, uh, and the body. And that's, um, in the context of chess, um, that's all of the body. You know, it does. Um, sporting contests aren't always about the most muscular or strongest person. Um, it can be about the kind of um, the person who has the greatest capacity in a particular way and that might be in their mind um in in terms of strategy so yeah if we think of the great sporting booms both in america and in britain in the 19th century 
you know, you'd got games like billiards or croquet or um, mind games, like um, by which I mean primarily games where it's the power of the mind that is being used, like chess, bridge. Um, a lot of the big board games were invented at the end of the 19th century. So it, it, it's a misunderstanding to think that it's physical athletic contests which uh, refer to sport. It, it's actually much more broad than that in terms of the definitions. I think chess is a sport in the same way that darts is a sport. And, um, you know, as as I've alluded to, and, you know, you you could argue that backgammon and um, all sorts of games of of skill and strategy requiring a physical um, articulation of that strategy are sports. It's, It's not just about the strategy is it it's the kind of articulation of that and almost like things like poker the way in which the player hides their strategy or um has aspects of gamesmanship so um as I say this has been a long contentious issue things like billiards and snooker have have argued this for years but um but certainly yes i do consider chess to be a sport Homer, I'm afraid you cannot run away from chess. The reason I got into chess was because it didn't involve running. I share your disdain for exercise. And to to trace the origin of the word, we really have to go back to Latin because this is one of those words that has its roots in Latin. And it's really based on two parts, two roots. The first part was dis, which means apart or away from. And we still, we have that common root in a lot of English words. If we dismantle something, we take it apart. If you discard something, you know, you get rid of it. If an attorney gets uh, kicked out of the bar, they're disbarred. Uh, So again, it's a very common root. It's the difference between attraction and distraction. If you're attracted to something, you're pulled towards it. If you're distracted, your attention is pulled away. And then the other root is the word portare or, or to carry or to move. It's the same root that we have in words like portable and import and export and transport, you know, when you're carrying or moving something. And so Latin put those two roots together and had the word as uh, deportare, which meant to carry away. And it's really the root of the word deport. That's how we have the word in English today. But it meant originally in Latin, it had that physical sense of physically taking someone away or carrying someone away. So then we just have to move forward a few centuries into the early French period. As French was emerging out of Latin, um, there was a need there to come up with a term to describe just sort of a something that would take your mind off of a serious matter, something that was just entertainment. Uh, amusement, you know, that's all it really meant. And they, so that sense of taking your mind off of a serious matter, taking your mind or pulling your mind away was, uh, they coined a word by taking those same two elements, the, the root meaning away and, and carry. It's not totally comfortable. I'm not going to lie, but I'm just thinking it's two to three minutes, hopefully of a little bit of pain and I'll be through it. The blood does seem to rush to your head very quickly. And it created the French word desport. And it meant, again, just that it literally carry away, but now it, in a more figurative sense of just distracting or taking your mind off of something. And that's how the word entered English. It was one of those French words that English borrowed during the period after the Norman Conquest. And it's first recorded as disport. So it comes in almost in the original French version in the early 1300s. And it, it remains, you know, again, that general word for amusement or entertainment or recreation or fun doesn't necessarily have anything to do with physical you know, activities or sports, just more kind of entertainment until the early 1400s, when the word loses that element at the front and goes from disport to just sport. And that happened a lot. There were a lot of French words that had an unaccented syllable at the beginning that was dropped. So now, you know, as we're in the 1400s, the word is now sport, but it still has that sense of uh, a pastime or enjoyment or just having fun. We still have that sense today when we talk about someone being a good sport. 
you know, we say they were a good sport about it. It meant that they were having a good time with it. They weren't taking it too seriously. So it's the same sense that still survives. In fact, as we get into the 1500s and 1600s, the meaning of the word expanded even further. Uh, it could be used to mean the theater, people who went to the theater. You know, that was described as sport because it was just pastime entertainment. Even lovemaking is described as sport uh, in some documents in the 1600s. But it also started to be applied to hunting, fishing, these kinds of more physical activities as well. And then it's really when we get into the 1800s that the word starts to pick up its more modern sense as a, a physical sport. Sport and something where you're actually, you know, physically exerting yourself to to do the sport. And it happens. The best guess why that meaning became restricted is because during the 1800s, sports started to be organized, and you started to have the development of sports leagues and sports teams. I mean, there were certainly obviously sports prior to that point, but they weren't as organized. I mean, football can be traced back to the Middle Ages, but they, they didn't really have teams with coaches and positions and, you know, referees. It wasn't really organized. But as, as sporting became more organized in the 1800s, the word sport started to be applied to that more and more so that by the time you get into the 1900s, the word sport is now become almost entirely restricted to that kind of physical activity. But that's a modern development of the word. If we look at the word historically, it had a much broader definition uh, and, and meant more in a sense of pastime or enjoyment. Because yeah, I wonder, does bowling seem more like an art? You it know? seems like a skill. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it, I would consider it a sport, though. Yeah. Right, and this is a retrospective categorization. So that that's an important thing to say. So if we think of the early Olympic Games, even in Paris in 1900, there because that was held over six months in the wider context of a uh, an exposition, uh, a world exposition that was happening at the time, there were things like balloon races um, in Paris in 1900. They didn't have clay pigeon shooting. They had live pigeon shooting. Um, there were, you know, motorised events. There were all sorts of events. And um, later, people have retrospectively categorised these as Olympic events or not. Uh, and motorised events have been increasingly deemed not to be Olympic events, but but that's a nonsense because um, motor boating was certainly included in the 1908 um, Olympic Games in London. So it's this retrospective categorization that people have used rather than reading away from the evidence at the time. And therefore that's where you get a lot of these misperceptions about sport purely being athletic contests. Andrea Botez, fresh off a chess boxing victory. Tony, she's looking sharp, man. Today, I don't hear so much from those crusaders defending this newer interpretation of the word sport when it comes to lobbying for the exclusion of things like golf and NASCAR. Advocates of those sports often accepted the crusaders' definition and then listed the physical strains involved in those sports. If being a game that allows beginners and casual players to have fun while also containing bottomless tactical and strategic depths, that demand tens of thousands of hours of study and play to reach Grandmaster level aren't enough to qualify as a sport. And if qualifying as a sport for centuries isn't enough to qualify as a sport today, and if helping establish tournament structures that sports use today doesn't do the trick, does elite Grandmasters losing weight due to the stress of a match do anything for you? According to ESPN, you know the sports network that covers chess, Anatoly Karpov lost 22 pounds facing the inexhaustible Kasparov in 1984. The World Championship match was eventually called off with a claim of health concerns. They list another Grandmaster who lost 17 pounds during a match and tell of a heart rate tracking company that monitored Grandmaster Mikhail Antipov, finding that he burned 560 calories in two hours of playing chess, which is comparable to the calories burned by Roger Federer playing tennis for an hour. Grandmaster Fabiano Caruana routinely loses 10 to 15 pounds during a tournament. The ESPN article went on to mention Robert Sapolsky of Stanford who claims that chess players can burn 6,000 calories a day during a tournament, 
comparing Grandmaster's stress response to what elite athletes experience. According to a Cordes article, another professor named Petra Ritter says this isn't fully proven by the means Sapolsky used, which is monitoring breathing rates, blood pressure, and muscle contractions. She referenced a more accurate test done on chess players that found a 10% increase in calorie consumption. I looked up that 2008 study. It was done on 20 male chess players with ELO ratings from 1250 to 2170. The amount of stress and concentration this level of player feels isn't likely comparable to two 2800s playing for the world title, so perhaps there's a wide range in how many calories are burned during an hour of chess. Regardless, it does cause an increase. It's really interesting, isn't it, in terms of uh, I heard that that took sort of 30 years to get made from the idea because people weren't, weren't convinced that a broad public could understand the strategic elements of chess. And yet you almost, to, to get that programme, you kind of didn't know, need to know the intricacies of chess. You just kind of needed to know whether she was winning or, or losing. So I think those kind of public perceptions have a great deal to do with um awareness of of the sport um but but also that it, it's something that it's got its own long and detailed history um that is perhaps not known in the public domain and yet were netflix to make a series about the history of chess you know i'm sure people um, could more easily access it because the rivalries um, the the you know the great scenes the underdogs all of those the east west rivalry the cold war rivalries are all things that we're very used to in sport so all of those stories are very present in chess I just wish that it was more known um, as a, as a discipline to a wider public I mean as you know I I do a lot of my research around women's sport and and particularly women's soccer which. In the UK, nobody's been interested in until 2019. And, you know, I can more or less guarantee that I was um, um, ploughing a very lone furrow for 20 plus years. And yet the thing that kept me going back was how compelling the stories were. Almost because it's a minority sport, they're just not known. Whereas I think, uh, you know, the likes of the the, the great rivalries and the... Um, the kind of last dance stories that we're, we're we're now seeing on TV are so well known that actually it it creates, although it's a marginalised space, it creates a space for the less well known stories to be told in new and imaginative ways. So I think that's what you're doing with your uh, YouTube documentaries. Uh, and again, I think what's interesting with what you're doing is is that it is a global sport and has been for for so many years, but kind of marginalised to some extent in the mainstream press. Um, and yet, if you think of the likes of, um, I, I don't imagine it's so big in the US as it is here. But I imagine it's more pool than snooker. But but British British snooker kind of blossomed in the 1970s when everybody got a colour TV and you could have a very simple scoring system on one right hand side of the corner and then you could have a, a, a very simple um, uh, countdown as to you know how many frames were left and all the rest in the in the left and and because it sort of sat down on, in snooker it was an indoor sport it was predictable it was basically two people slugging it out over a table and it made it very very understandable to a really broad public and armchair audience and i don't see why that the same could not be the case with chess <laughs>